after all that, the real reason you guys are here is to what to see amazing, astonishing, actually somewhat unbelievable photography of Garrett Heiss. Um, I learned about Garrett through the Friends of Eagle Bluffs Photography Facebook group, um, where people share really cool images that they capture um, at Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area as all of these just parade of birds and wildlife comes through throughout the year. And I think last year, you know, every year we really uh, sends out a holiday card in December to a bunch of our friends and supporters. Um, and Garrett donated one of his images last year, which is a really cool close up of some river otters playing on the ice. Um, and I've just been kind of following his stories ever since. And he is going to share some of the stories behind the photography that he takes, a couple of really cool videos to give you a window into what he sees out there. So, Garrett, thank you so much for putting this together. And um, it's quite an effort and for sharing your evening with us. Everybody hear me? No. No. <laughs> How about? No. There we are. There it is. Okay. I'm trying to start over. Can everybody hear me? So, uh, I haven't uh, actually been doing this for very long. Um, I, but first, I guess I want to say thank you for having me out. And uh, I'll ask if you can uh, try to hold your questions to the end. I got I brought a lot. And I'm going to try to get through it in an hour. I've never had a problem talking. So it's going to be difficult to get through this in an hour. Um, about eight years ago, I was in a Best Buy. And I, uh, I bought this camera. And my, my goal was just to slow life down a little bit. You know, I just, uh, I was always driving to work, trying to get there as fast as humanly possible down these back roads. And I would see an owl or an eagle. And I just wanted to have something that would give me an excuse to stop, pull over, and, and breathe. You know, I basically, I was, I was getting ready to turn 40. That's pretty scary. So I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, it turns out this was a horrible purchase. I was just explaining my photos to everybody. I would say, hey, you see that dot there? That's uh, that's an eagle. <laughs> see, that? see that dot? That was an owl. And uh, so right away, I decided I'm going to need a better camera. So I bought this one. It's, it's a little nicer. And uh, I didn't think about, you know, having to know how to use it. So uh, these first photos are going to be kind of grainy, um, but I wanted to start at the beginning of the journey, you know. So on December 13th, 2019, I was dragging along, the sun was setting, and out on the ice, I saw these two deer. And it was a very Disney-esque image, I thought. I just thought it was cute. I didn't, nothing else jumped out at me. Just well, that's cute. I'm going to take a picture of it, right? And then I went home, and I thought to myself, that was a that was a neat thing to see. So the next day, I'm going to go to the exact same place because maybe there will be something else in that in that place that yielded something that cute. And when I got there the next day, those two deer was they were still there, and and something about that kind of stuck with me and I didn't understand what I was looking at yet, right? I didn't understand what I was seeing. It's just two deer and maybe some deer poop on the ice, right? That's that's what that looks like. So again, I went home and I told myself, you know what? I wanted to slow down. I'm gonna take tomorrow off work. I'm gonna go back in the morning and see what's going on. And, and the next image might be a little disturbing and I apologize for that. Um, but I got out there the next morning, and now instead of two deer, there was just the one, and that wasn't poop on the ice. That was that was blood. It was a deer season, and this deer had ran into the refuge, probably from some public hunting land where it had been poorly shot. And you know, I'm not anti hunting at all. It happens. Hunting is very important to conservation, so don't read into that, right? But just a sad story about a deer that was down on the ice, and there was nothing I could do. I couldn't go out there and put it out of its misery. It felt wrong to just leave, so I just stayed. 
and I just paid attention to what was happening. And uh, the predators were circling, okay? The coyote was circling that deer, you know, about 100 yards out. Juvenile bald eagles were landing. And in the wintertime, when the rivers are frozen, juvenile bald eagles are just vultures, right? We don't have vultures in the wintertime, so the young bald eagles stay alive. That's what they do. And pretty soon, you had a couple of coyotes out there, and four juvenile bald eagles, and they're all just waiting for that, that deer to expire, right? And it struggled to get up, and I watched that, and it just couldn't do it. And I understood it, and I understood the attempt to survive, and I really thought that the story that I was witnessing was about this deer, right? That's what I thought that I was photographing. Uh, finally, he gave up, and you could see from his posture, if you will, right, that he was giving up. And the sun set, and I knew that I was coming back the next day, but I knew in my heart that, you know, he wasn't going to make it, right? And I apologize, and it's a sad story right off the bat, but he talked about it. <laughs> so, luckily, I had this, this prepared for you. <laughs> next morning, there was a murder of crows on the deer. He didn't make it. We knew that was going to happen. I went ahead and photographed it. Uh, when I raised the camera, the crows pulled, you know, they flew away. And I thought, oh, I'll finish this. And I even typed Finn over the photo, you know, like I was a fancy photographer already. <laughs> but then I got to thinking about this story, this thing that I witnessed, and I realized it's not about the deer that died. That's, that's, that's not the photo I took. The photo I took is about the deer that stood out there for 30 hours with its brother or companion on the ice in the open during the hunting season with predators circling. And I realized, as corny as it sounds, I actually got a photo of love, right? There's no scientific explanation for that deer to have stayed there. And, you know, sometimes when you tell people that animals have emotion, you're gonna meet somebody that's gonna argue with you and you're gonna say something along the lines of, well, my dog loves me. And then they're going to say, your dog doesn't love you. Your dog just treats you like that because you feed it, right? You know, well, that mother goose loves that gosling. That's not love. That that goose has to raise those goslings to, you know, genetically survive in the future, right? But there's none of that in this photograph, right? Those are two male deer. They're identical, by the way. And twins are very common in deer, so I like to imagine they're brothers. Right? They're young. This is only their second year of life. They're just very small six pointers. I know hunters are nodding, right? You got a camel right there. <laughs> there was there was no reason for that deer to stay there. He was there for 30 hours that I know of, possibly longer, right? Gunshots are going off while I'm taking those photos. And I'll tell you something else. I, as I progressed into the photography, one of the things that I learned right away was that when you raise a camera, deer run, right? They think it's a gun. He didn't run. You know, he stayed out there next to his brother. And I decided that's what I want to do. I want to take photos of moments, right? Because until then, I'd just been collecting baseball cards of animals, right? Pokemon cards, you know, here's a, here's a raccoon, I'll trade you for a deer, right? <laughs> and I decided I wanted to take better photos. So then I had to go into, <laughs> yeah, forever dead, right? So I bought this. <laughs> and I discovered uh, Eagle Bluff Conservation Area, and uh, a lot of people uh, helped me learn how to take photos, gave me advice, and uh, I watched 10,000 hours of YouTube videos. And uh, this next part, I'm going to try to get to pretty fast, but I just want to go over the diversity that is here in Missouri, because I grew up in Missouri, and I even considered myself outdoorsy, and I had no idea what was out there. And I'm going to warn you, it's a lot of birds. <laughs> all right. I'm not a birder. All right. Uh, everybody's like, oh, you're, you're just into birds. It's Missouri. Okay. okay. Not a lot of mountain lions and elk and moose out there. So we're about to see a lot of birds, but please don't think I'm a birder. <laughs> Oh, 
I didn't take that photo. But I wanted to talk about ducks because the state managed uh, wildlife wetlands wouldn't exist without ducks. They just wouldn't. That's that's primarily what they're for. There might be other reasons that they're there, but if it wasn't for duck hunters, and again, I'm not anti-hunting, if it wasn't for those guys and, and the conservation building these wetlands and raising and lowering the water to attract the ducks, we wouldn't have them. So I needed to donate some time to ducks. <laughs> that meant I needed to swim with ducks. <laughs> So I needed, I decided what I needed was a floating hide. I needed something that would camouflage me and allow me to be in the water with the duck so I could take the pictures feet from the ducks instead of 50 yards away, right? There's only two of these available in the market. One of them is sold in the USA, it's inflatable. And uh, I'd already been at the wetlands long enough to know that I didn't want to put my forever dead camera in an inflatable boat <laughs> around Sharp Six. So I needed to buy that one, and uh, it's only for sale in a shop in a small village in Norway. <laughs> yeah. So I had to go to a bank. I had to convert my money to euros, and I had to wire transfer like 1,500 euros. And then I had to have this heavy device shipped to the United States. I had to go through customs. So I thought, this is my chance to be a big shot. I got to buy a suit. I can't walk into a bank to wire transfer euros in jeans and a t-shirt so i had to buy a suit also i i walked into the bank and i remember the bank manager asked me why i was doing it not because i had to have a reason he was just curious and with the straightest face possible i just told him i, I want to take a better picture of the dog yeah that's so I started taking pictures of ducks uh, in my floating hide all the way from Norway. <laughs> now I'm going to try to go through these pretty, pretty fast. I'm not going to, uh, some of you might know a lot about wild animals. I've photographed over 500 species of animals now in eight years, all right? And uh, I couldn't bring that many because they said an hour, right? So I'm going to skip a lot of a lot of animals. With the American food, this is the number one uh, duck that you will see out there. Right? There's more of these, I think, in America than anything else. Hunters call them trash ducks. They're called ivory built ducks. I call them eagle food. Right? Uh, blue winged teal is maybe the most popular uh, duck for hunters. It's the second most common duck that you're going to see in Missouri, uh, maybe next to the mallard. Depends on where you're at. If you're in a city park, it'd be mallards. If you're in a refuge, it's going to be the blue winged teal. And then you have the wood duck, which can't be hunted. And I think this is photographer's favorite duck. That was the first photo where I thought to myself, hey, I might be kind of good at this, All right? And uh, that was a floating high photo. And then after about uh, four or five years, I finally got close to the male wood duck. And that was a pretty big achievement. That's a hard duck to get close to. So uh, that, was a, that was a big deal. It's an absolutely beautiful animal. And uh, that's why you can't hunt them because they were hunted to, you know, near extinction, right? And Missouri Conservation is working really hard to bring these back. All the duck boxes that you see in your local wetlands are primarily for wood ducks. Uh, Northern shovelers are really cool. I, I like them. They have uh, ridiculous looking faces. And then it just blows my mind how many different kinds of ducks there were. So when I was a kid, I just thought, well, that's duck. Right. There's like 45 kinds of duck in Missouri. Right. So you got uh, lesser scouts. No, oh, I got a little laser pointer. You got lesser scouts and buffleheads and mallards, green wing teals, uh, northern pintails, ring neck ducks, runny ducks, and the American wigeon, just to name a few. Ducks everywhere. Uh, lots of other waterfowl, more birds, I know. Lots of other waterfowl uh, at Eagle Bluff Conservation Area and other similar sites. Uh, this is my favorite bird in America uh, that's that's not a um, not a raptor. So this is the uh, high bill tree and everything this bird does is cute. It stands cute, it pops its head cute, it talks cute, it shakes water cute. Um, find, find my video and just watch this this animal being cute. <laughs> This is its less cute cousin, horn creep. This is pretty rare, and photographers lose their minds. Uh, when one of these shows up, the bank will be lined with people with cameras, similar, you know, similar to mine. 
Uh, there's three kinds of merganser, which is another uh, duck-like bird that hunters hate because they taste like fish. <laughs> so you have the uh, the hooded merganser, oops, <laughs> the hooded merganser, the common merganser, and then one of the prettiest photos I've ever taken is this red-breasted merganser. Uh, we've got some pretty big birds in Missouri. I thought I, I thought you know that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> we have the uh, America's heaviest bird, the American white pelican. Uh, these land in Missouri in flocks of hundreds and occasionally they're lucky flocks of thousands. Uh, they're really neat. They tornado out of the sky. Um, I have been within 25 or 30 feet of a couple of hundred of these when they took off. Uh, it took me hours to get there. I crawled 100 inches at a time in that floating hut. And when they would take off, that would rattle like a tent in a storm. You know, but they, uh, they move a lot of air when they fly. Huh. Uh, they are way bigger than you think. Most of the time when you see these, they're hundreds of yards away. They are huge. <laughs> Maybe four feet tall, eight foot wingspan. Yeah, absolutely massive. Uh, mute swans, we have three different kinds of swans that show up in Missouri. We have mute swans, trucker swans, and thunder swans. Um, most of what you will see in city parks are gonna be your mute swans. They're the pretty ones. The other swans are a little less pretty and you'll see those in the refuges. Um, their babies are called cygnets, and they're one of the few birds where the babies are the same color as the adults, so you wind up with a pretty picture there. Snow geese. Uh, I, has anybody ever heard of Los Bluffs? Yes. Up in northwestern Missouri? Uh, that's been featured on uh, BBC wildlife documentaries like four times in 20 years, and that's because the snow geese land there twice a year in the millions. Um, Let's see if I can. Yeah, in the in the millions. So, um, if you ever get a chance to go there, go there. There's also Swan Lake, which is only an hour from here. Um, Eagle Bluffs doesn't get a lot of snow geese. I'm not sure why. It's just not on their route. But Swan Lake is very close. It's also a, a managed wetland for ducks. And uh, anytime you can be in earshot of a million animals, I'd highly recommend it. It's, it's life changing. This is a cormorant, and uh, that blew my mind. Uh, I know that a lot of outdoorsy people know that they're here. I had no clue. And the only reason I even knew the word cormorant was from wildlife documentaries, right? They're ocean, it's an oceanic bird. So the first time I saw one, it was in a tree next to a pond. And I, I thought I was, you know, making a discovery. Uh, it turns out they're everywhere, but they're a very neat bird with turquoise eyes. Ah, biggest surprise is the abundance of shorebirds. Recently, I went to Gulf Shores, Alabama, uh, just this past year, and I thought, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to photograph stuff I've never seen before. And all I saw were birds that I've already seen in Missouri. Which is, <laughs> as far away as you can be from an ocean in the United States, I think, is where we live. And we have so many shorebirds. Um, snipes are a shorebird. Snipes are real. So if you got a grandpa that sent you out on snipe hunt when you were a kid, <laughs> there's a chance you could have found one. <laughs> uh, there's only two shorebirds that are in Missouri all year round. The spotted sandpiper is one of them. The killdeer is the other one. The rest of them are migratory. They're only here in the spring, basically, uh, late kind of late spring. Um, this is a foul rope, Wilson's foul rope. This is a unique bird. Most of the time, it's the, the male birds that are decorated and the females are kind of dull, right? The foul rope is the opposite. So that's the female, she's the colorful, bright one. That happens a few times, I'll point it out. And then uh, Upland Sandpiper uh, showed up at Eagle Bluffs, which I think speaks a lot towards Eagle Bluffs because it's not Upland, right? That's, that's a lowland but they managed that area so nice it attracted this bird and held it there for a few days. And again, all the local photographers lost their minds. Um, this is a Sora. This is the loudest bird in the wetland. You've all heard it. Um, most of you probably haven't seen it. There's a few faces in here I recognize that have. This is a robin sized bird that you can hear from easily a quarter mile away. It's, it's incredibly loud, uh, hangs out in green beds. Uh, very, very difficult to photograph, so I'm kind of proud of that one. And then we get, anytime I, I come across any animal um, that's called snowy something, I get kind of excited, you know, because it just, that's a very exotic, right? Snowy clover just doesn't sound like something that you would run into here. So 
snowy plovers, semi-pollinated plovers, ruddy turnstones. I don't know who names these. But so be Godwit, Black Neck Stealth, and the American Avocet. This is the American Avocet right here. This might be the prettiest bird in North America. Um, this particular photograph, I was in the floating hive, and I had spent about three hours crawling through two inches of water on my hands and knees, dragging that floating hive along behind me. And the way you do that is you, you move an inch, and then you count to 10, and then you move another inch, because you don't want them to know that you're coming. So it takes me a really long time to go 20, 30 yards. <laughs> but after I took that photo, I, I turned around to go back, and there was about 12 photographers on the bank, and they were very, very jealous. Maybe they could get a so I think I took that photo from, you know, 15 feet away. Yeah. The size of the camera is not to be far away. The size of the camera is so that you can get a better quality photo in low light, right? So uh, those last two cameras I showed you, that's actually the same focal distance lens. The bigger one is just better quality and low light. Uh, waiting birds. Um, and that was one of the most technically difficult photos I took. Uh, that was uh, as the sun set, just that last little light showing on that gray egret. And uh, Missouri is, is pretty lucky. We get all three of the white egrets. So we have the cattle egrets, snowy egrets, and the gray egret. Uh, the only egret I've never seen in Missouri is a reddish egret. That's primarily just in Florida. Uh, maybe it'll happen someday, but for now, just those three. We get ibises here, which blew my mind. Right, so and we get all three of them. Right, we get the white face ibis, the white ibis, and glossy ibis. We get great blue herons, of course. I mean, every fish pond in America has got a great blue heron, right? Yeah, everybody in the room just went, I know that one. <laughs> yeah, but we also get the little blue heron, and this one was so young that it wasn't blue yet. And that's another bird that when somebody sees it, it goes out on the internet, and you got to get there quick, or there will be you know, 15 photographers standing there already. We get night herons, and then we have little green herons. And we even get cranes and the very rare stork, right? So this was uh, southeastern Missouri, a wood stork. And then we get the occasional uh, sand hill cranes in uh, northwestern and uh, southwestern Missouri. All in river bottom, you know, lowlands. We get goals and turns. So real ocean birds. You don't have to go to the beach to lose a French fry to a single. Uh, we get a lot of different kinds of turns. We get Caspian turns, Corsair's turns, even black turns. All three of these photos were taken at Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area. We get ring bill of goals and the occasional Franklin's goal. And then I threw in a tree swallow here. I, I threw in the tree swallow because um, that's, Again, it's one of my favorite birds. It's really hard to photograph. They move very fast. They're very tiny. Um, and you only find them really over the water, that, that particular kind of swallow. Kingfishers. I think everybody loves Belted Kingfisher. This is another one where the female is the bright and colorful one. The male has a white chest in the shape of a heart. The female has the red feathers. So we have her perched. Diving and then exploding out of water complete with a minnow. <laughs> Interesting photo here. <laughs> to get a good photo of a kingfisher, for example, to get this photo, that branch wasn't actually there. I zip tied that to another branch so that I could get it to land on that. Uh, kingfisher has a really specific flight pattern that it does over and over and over again all day long. If you introduce a perch into that flight pattern, it is a 100% guarantee that the kingfisher will land on that perch and see if that's a better fishing spot than the ones that it has. So it occurred to me that I could make a no fishing sign in my garage and maybe get this cute photo. And it worked. Uh, we get a lot of tiny birds too. Um, and this is where I get accused of being a birder. But again, it's Missouri. If we had wolves, I'd be photographing wolves. Uh, so instead, I'm photographing yellow warblers, which might be the happiest bird I've ever seen in my life. Most of them don't stay here. This one did nest. And uh, in this photo, you can see mom and dad there. Um, warblers, I think, are birders' favorite birds. And uh, 
some stay all year long. You can get them in your backyards, but if you go to Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area in late April, I'm looking for a nod here. Okay, late April, that place would be crawling with warblers and uh, a lot of binoculars. Uh, this is the most common one you'll find, yellow rough warbler, but there's also palm warblers, black pole warblers, and prothonotary warblers. Uh, <laughs> Again, I think they ran out of names, so they just kind of describe the bird and then add warbler on the end. You got the common yellow throat and then the black throated green warbler. Uh, this is an indigo bunting. I toss it in there. They show up at the same time and they're kind of pretty. American red star is another warbler. And then we've got two other orange birds here. We've got the orchard oriole, orchard oriole and the Baltimore oriole. We even get the painted bunting. And this was a dark, cloudy day, but it still looks like God gave a kid a box of Crayolas and a coloring book. It looks like a made up bird. It looks photoshopped. That's a real bird, shows up in Missouri. Um, very difficult to find, but uh, if you uh, befriend a lot of birders, they'll, they'll tell you where to, where to go. <laughs> Some other neat ones that we get, especially at Eagle Bluffs, we get the scissor tail fly catcher, it's an Oklahoma State bird. Its tail is twice as long as its body. The rose breasted grosbeak and the yellow billed cuckoo. Uh, quail are coming back, thanks to Missouri Conservation. Um, we don't have the, the quail like in band with the thing on their head, you know, the little dangly thing, but we do have northern bobwhites. These are, the, this is the male. And, uh, we're starting to see those a lot more often in here then. They went away for quite a, quite a while. Uh, I was lucky enough to watch three male turkeys duking it out one day. And I uh, caught a female ringneck pheasant. And then I was really lucky and got to see some baby wild turkeys. That's what they look like. So they're spotted like leopard when they're babies. And then raptors. And I think raptors are my favorite thing to put it out, right? Uh, again, it's Missouri, we don't have wolves, you know, we don't have, we, we might have a mountain lion or two, but I'm not going to get to photograph it, you know, so uh, most of the killing that's done in Missouri by animals is done by raptors, you know, far more than, you know, your coyotes, and your snakes and stuff, your raptors are, are uh, Missouri's murderers. Uh, your small bird raptors are going to be your sharp shin hog, sharp shin hog, the uh, American kestrel and the merlin. Uh, the sharp shin you're going to find in your backyard around your bird feeders, okay? The American kestrel, this is the one that you see hovering over highway medians, all right? And you'll find them in the wetlands, but anytime you see that small bird hovering over a highway median, that's what it is right there. And then the merlin you're going to find in your wetlands. This is just a, a more rare falcon than this one, and, and you'll find this in conservation areas or maybe on uh, rural roads, like perched on top of a telephone pole. And these are pretty small, these two. These are tiny little falcons, not much bigger than a robin. The most common raptor in Missouri is a red-tailed hawk, right? Every, every time you see a hawk, you pretty much just go, that's a red-tailed hawk, and you'll be right, and you can impress your friends. <laughs> okay? What you don't know is, is that there's a lot of different kinds of red-tailed hawks. And here's an example, we've got a Criders red-tailed hawk. Mm -hmm. And uh regular red tail hawk and a dark morph red tail hawk. There's they're so common that they show up in you know different colorations and uh, birders lose their minds. Uh, a northern harrier, also called the gray ghost. This is the one uh, that you also see hovering over fields in the wetlands. Uh, sometimes they're called swamp hawks. All right, so most of what you're gonna see in the river bottoms and the wetlands are gonna be northern harriers. Um the male is the one that's called the gray ghost. It's white, pretty rare. Mostly you're gonna see females. So if you ever see a white hawk flying low over a field and then hovering in place, you know, that's that's what you're looking at. So in Northern Harrier, they've got a face like an owl. It's just a really interesting uh, raptor. Red-shouldered hawk, this is another backyard bird. Also hangs out in the river bottoms. Um, eats a lot of small stuff, you know, frogs, crawdads, uh, mice bowls. And then we get a couple of travelers, larger hawks, the Swainson hawk and the rough-legged hawk. And that's mostly gonna be in the northern half of Missouri. Peregrine falcons, uh, we're in peregrine falcon territory right now, all the bluffs along the river, and they are coming back, right? 
So uh, for a long time in this country, the only place you could find a peregrine falcon was in a big city like Chicago or New York. They were using the skyscrapers because they'd been you know, uh, eradicated uh, like so many raptors. But with all the raptor protections in place, now they're coming back. And uh, there's actually a nesting pair somewhere at Eagle Bluffs. Um, most of the bluffs at Eagle Bluffs are private property, so I haven't been able to find that nest. But I know they're there because I see them every single year. Uh, right around the nesting time. Uh, and then kites, Mississippi kites. These are these are really cool, and this is going to be a huge year for them. You know the cicadas are coming, and uh, Mississippi kites are going to be dying out on those cicadas. So when you hear those cicadas, head down to Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area, or even uh, was it Muddy Muddy Bottoms, just just across the bridge here, and you're going to see lots of these guys. We've got two kinds of vultures. We've got black vultures mostly Lake of the Ozarks and South, and then the turkey vulture that you see up here all the time. Um, and occasionally, I uh, I can't use the floating hide. Occasionally, I can't use camouflage. I have to get out there in my neon look at me kayak <laughs> and, uh, and risk some pretty serious damage to that camera and lens because I'm taking pictures of this bird. This is an osprey, and they're showing up all the time now. This is Probably the most fun bird uh, to photograph in the world. They, you know, they dive, uh, talons first into the water, completely submerge, come up with fish a lot of times bigger than what bald eagles have come up with. Uh, very, very impressive. About a five foot wingspan, yellow eyes. Just a just a neat looking, neat looking bird, even on a cloudy, stormy day. Owls. Uh, I've photographed nine species of owls in the United States now. I'm just going to show you the ones that I photographed in Missouri. All right. Uh, great horned owls, the king of the owls, uh, they'll take something as large as a raccoon and uh, they even um, predate on other owls. So, great horned owls are known for hunting and killing every other kind of owl that we have around here. The barred owl, this is the most common one. This is the one that you're going to see more than anything. Okay, this one was at uh, Muddy Bottoms, just across the bridge. Then we have screech owls. I'm not sure who named that. Um, they don't screech, right? So when you see a screech owl in the movies and you hear that sound, that sound that you're hearing is actually a barn owl. Screech owls wing. It sounds like there's a tiny little horse up in the tree. <laughs> um, they, they, yeah, they don't, they don't screech. I think what used to happen is, I think people would go to bed, hear the screech, and then wake up in the morning and see a screech owl sunning itself while the barn owl was hiding in the barn. And so they just assumed that that's what was screeching. Uh, shorter owls show up every year in Missouri, also called swamp owls. Uh, so you're going to find these in your river bottoms. Uh, if it's the river bottoms right outside of Jefferson City, if it's Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area or Muddy Bottoms, that's where these guys are going to be. Um, they like real swampy tall grasses and uh, they're big bowl eaters and really exciting to photograph because they come out about half an hour before the sun sets. So you really get a good chance to see these every day. Most owls, you have to be lucky, right? And then we also have the barn owl in southwestern Missouri in river bottoms. You will come across cross burrowing out, they hang out in swampy areas. And then once about every five years or so in the river bottoms around St. Louis, a snowy owl will show up. Uh, it never has a happy ending, all right? If a snowy owl is this far south, it's because it's starving. So that never ends well, um, but uh, you get a chance to get a photograph of one without having to go to the Arctic Circle, which is pretty nice. Uh, it's, it's not all birds, right? There's reptiles, amphibians, insects. I'll go through some of those. I love butterflies, right? Uh, it's one of my manliest teachers. <laughs> so I love swallowtail butterflies and I love monarch butterflies. And I, I got to take just a brief second to talk about the monarch because it's one of those things that nobody understands. When I was a kid, you could collect them and put them in a jar. Now they're endangered, protected. You can't. And uh, what's interesting about the monarch is every monarch in the world flies to the same mountain in Mexico. It's the same few acres, right? And then they freeze, fly across the Gulf of Mexico to America, lay an egg, die. That egg turns into a caterpillar, goes into a chrysalis, turns into a primordial soup, 
becomes a butterfly, right? I'm not exaggerating, primordial soup, okay? <laughs> then that butterfly lives here all summer long, then it lays an egg, it dies, right? And the process starts all over again, and somehow the grandchildren of the monarchs that made the trip here find their way back to the same mountain in Mexico, and nobody understands why or how it's humanly possible. It's one of the biggest mysteries, and uh, that's why I love that one so much. I was, uh, I spent a whole day trying to take a wildlife photo and I saw nothing but this one crayfish. <laughs> that might be the best crayfish photo I've ever seen. Uh, I spent a lot of time with that crayfish. Uh, more swallowtails, and then my favorite insect is the six-spotted tiger beetle. Uh, anytime you're hiking any kind of path through the woods or, or anywhere and you see that bright flash of green running, that's what it is. Uh, just a very cool bug. I was taking photos of osprey in, in the river bottoms. Uh, I was walking through the river bottoms. I had to go up to the top of a bluff where some ospreys were nesting, and the woods were buzzing, and it was incredibly loud. It was in my ears, um, and I found this. And what this is, this is where a queen honeybee had landed on a branch, and it was probably 45 degrees out. And so all of the other honeybees came att attracted to her pheromones, following her as she's looking for a new nest. But they also surround her like this to keep her alive, to keep her warm. And that's why it was buzzing. And that's why it was so electric. Um, I went up to the bluffs, got my osprey photos. And when I had come back, they found a new uh, place to have a hive about 50 feet up in a tree, just 30 yards from where I had discovered this ball of bees. And uh, I was pretty nervous taking those taking those photos. Uh, yeah, I, I saw my girl one too many times. <laughs> uh, lots of turtles. We've got snapping turtles and box turtles and soft shell turtles. Uh, the most common turtle that you're going to see in the river bottoms is going to be similar to this. Uh, and it's got a big red ear that's under that flap of skin there that you can't see. Lots of amphibians, lots of frogs, right. different sizes. Some of them are so small, you think they're a cricket. Then the American bullfrog's pretty large. We got a lot of tree frogs, toads, lots of snakes. Um, I guess the only takeaway from the snakes, and a lot of people are going to tell you how to tell if a snake is venomous or not, but in my opinion, it just boils down to the eyes. That's the one thing that's never going to change. So round eye, crescent moon shaped pupil. Or, you know, Voldemort slip. Right? <laughs> now, this is the this is the cotton mouth of the water moccasin. I've uh, fo I photographed that from like two feet away, laying down with a little tiny lens. I did the same thing with uh, copperheads and, and stuff like that. Uh, and then I might be one of the few people that has this photo. This is Missouri's largest snake. This is the bull snake. We just have lots of snakes. Northern water snake. This is perfectly harmless. Everybody thinks these are water moccasins. They're not. They're, they're not going to bother you. Uh, and then we've got lizards and salamanders. A little cave salamander there. And some skinks that uh, really like each other. <laughs> and uh, this is a pretty, uh, this is not a good photo at all. I just brought it because that's a siren. This is another water moccasin. And in its mouth is a siren. And I don't think anybody has a photo of a siren because that's a 100% aquatic amphibian that only has two front legs. It's uh, And the, those legs are like vestigial. Like they don't really work. They just kind of flop around. So uh, the only reason I got this photo is because the snake came up to breathe while I was eating it. Uh, mammals. Mammals are cute. <laughs> yeah, raccoons are pretty cute. Uh, to get photos of mammals, I had to abandon the floating hide. Uh, so I thought, what am I going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy three sniper suits, one for every season. And uh, I'm pretty sure I'm on a government watch list now. But uh, it's worth it. It's worth it. Uh, White-tailed deer, they're everywhere, of course. Uh, I like photographing the bucks and the fawns. Uh, I wanted to see how close I could get to a skunk without getting sprayed. It turns out I can get I can get pretty close. Uh, that's the dangerous end if you're not. And that photo made me pretty nervous. Uh, raccoons are always cute, no matter what. 
Now I'm here he says, I know they're pests, but they're everywhere, especially in the river bottoms. Uh, this one was actually a blind raccoon uh, with a big noxious out of his ear, and he's still so cute. So, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I shared the photo of the rabbits because uh, I think the rabbits are really important. Uh, one thing that I learned is uh, it's a sign of a healthy ecosystem. So if you're hanging out in a conservation area and you don't see a rabbit, something's wrong. Okay, so you should always see rabbits. Everything eats rabbits. Uh, muskrats, same thing. When you're hanging out at Eagle Bluffs or Los Bluffs, all those little huts out there that a lot of people think are beaver huts, those are actually uh, muskrat huts. And, um, you know, they, they get eaten by everything. Uh, the American beaver. I was actually uh, set up to take photos of the river robbers. Um, the holiday card that he mentioned, I was taking photos of a family group of river robbers, and I couldn't move because I was in all that camouflage. And I could only see directly ahead of me, but I could hear an animal coming up behind me. So I kind of looked over and I just saw a branch moving over a rise, you know, and I had to sit up. And when I sat up, I got that photo of that beaver. Um, very, very ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, well, it, the right angle, he's cute here. Same, same beaver. And so they, at the wrong angle, they're not attractive. Yeah. Uh, American river otters, including the baby. I like to call them water dogs. They're always pretty happy. Uh, there will be some more photos that I'll cycle through when I'm done talking, and you'll see some more otter photos. Uh, the American mink. This was a friend of mine. This is Buttons. Uh, she's got a distinct patch in her fur here. This is uh, Eagle Bluff Conservation Area. And uh, I, I knew she was there, I kept showing up. She would come out in the dark and then she would leave before the sun would rise. And I kept going back for three weeks and just laying down in one spot, waiting and waiting and waiting. And I finally got uh, that photo right there. Uh, she's at least five years old. And uh, I think her last litter, she had like six little kits. And another photographer actually got photos of her carrying those kits across the road. Yeah. And that's the uh, family muscle a day. So that's the same family as otters, badgers, weasels. Right, uh, even the wolverine, coyotes. This was Eagle Bluff Conservation Area. I was photographing egrets, uh, catching you know frogs, right, flipping them in the air and catching them. And I was just having a good time photographing that. And this coyote came down and just stared at me for a pretty long time. And uh, even a little coyote pup here, a red fox. I haven't photographed a gray fox yet or the bob. Yeah, hope it too, but I've never had a red fox encounter that I didn't love and remember forever, uh, including this one where dad showed up with an entire war of baby cottontails. And I asked a slightly disturbing photo that somebody's got to see these two guys. <laughs> and uh, the American badger. And I took that photo at Eagle Bus Conservation Area. And that's an animal that's so rare in Missouri now that conservation actually asks that you send the photos and to prove it so they can track how many we have here. They're real common in Wisconsin and the Dakotas, but they're disappearing from Missouri. So if you see a badger, let your local conservation agent know. Uh, so that's the you know the general biodiversity of river bottoms. How, how am I doing on time? Great. Thanks. Great. All right. So now I'm going to talk about bald eagles. Um, and uh, I'm happy to throw some numbers at you, all right? Lots of lots of numbers, a little bit of math. Um, I got lucky enough to find a bald eagle's nest that I could be above at a, at a decent angle and, and get some pretty intricate shots. Uh, this is the uh, first year they built this nest, this pair of eagles. Uh, I know that because I got to watch them build it, right? Uh, that's dad bringing in some, you know, some nest material to cover the eggs with. Uh, as this video is playing, I'll, I'll let you know that the first year that they had this nest, it failed. I, I went back every day. It didn't have anything to do with me. They had no clue that I was there. Uh, I would go before sunrise, leave after sunset, and I'm in those sniper suits. Um, the nest failed, and I watched it all day, and it was a very cold day. It was 30 degrees out, kind of mid to late March. Right, 
So it was a couple of weeks after the eggs should have hatched. Um, and there was nothing in the nest sitting on the eggs. And I was about to give up when the mom showed up. And I thought, oh, okay, we're still on, right? Maybe, maybe there's an egg in there and it'll hatch. But instead what happened was she shows up, here she comes, and she lands in the nest and then just gently moves the, the top off of the egg and she would just look at it for a minute and fly away. And that would keep me there for a couple hours. And then a couple hours later, she would come back. And I realized that she'd already abandoned these eggs. And uh, what I was seeing was just sorrow, right? So this was another one of those moments for me, which is why I brought this, this story. Sometimes you see things in the, in the wild that's just actual emotion. And that's a photo of that emotion. She's just uncovering. You can actually see the egg is right there. She's just uncovering it, looks at it, flies away, nothing ever hatched. Uh, bald eagles mate for life. Um, and uh, even when it's not mating season, they meet twice a day. They meet at dawn and they meet at dusk. So even in the, this photo is the dead of winter, there's no nest, there's no reason for them to be together, but they mate for life and they go their separate ways and do their own hunting. But twice a day is 100% guaranteed by me that they will meet on the same tree at dawn and at dusk. Uh, probably so she can yell at him about something. That <laughs> but nevertheless, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area and, uh, and bald eagles. In uh, 1782, just six years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, they decided the bald eagle was gonna be our national symbol. Uh, ben Franklin wanted the turkey, and luckily, thank God, everybody talked about it. <laughs> so we got we got the bald eagle. Uh, at that point in time, there were 100,000 active nests in the continental United States, right? So that's 200,000 breeding bald eagles and at least another 100,000 more, right? But we're just going to talk about nests so I can keep the numbers that I memorized. 100,000 active nests, continental U.S., 1782, all right? By 1940, uh, eagle populations had been decimated to the point that they were endangered in 43 states, all right? And so they passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act. The problem is that also in 1940, there was a synthetic insecticide that was becoming very popular in the world called DDT, and through the power of the food chain, this would get into the bald eagle system and cause the eggshells to be so thin that when they would sit on them, it would crush the eggs. I see a lot of people nodding. I'm just going to tell you about it anyway. <laughs> so, the, you know, the problem was that uh, they were already pretty critically endangered in 43 states, and... Uh, from 1940 to 1962, the DDT worsened the problem to the point that in 1962, there were only 417 active bald eagle nests in the lower 48, okay? So not counting Alaska, but keep in mind, that's from 100,000, right? In less than 200 years. Uh, in 1962, a lady wrote a book called Silent Spring, and that kind of got everybody behind the, the bald eagles. And uh, we outlawed DDT, and then the very next year, 1963, Canada outlawed it. And a lot of other things happened. Um, they passed a, a full Raptor Protection Act. They started finding power companies um, to, to make them put up, you know, protections to stop these birds from getting electrocuted, things of that nature. Um, from 1963 to 2007, that's exactly 44 years. I'm 44 years old. So in the span of my lifetime, we went from 417 active nests to 10,000, right? And that 10,000, that's the mark. That's where something is endangered or not. So at that point, the bald eagle is no longer endangered. And the really neat thing about these numbers is population growth are exponential, right? So once there was 10,000, then it only took 13 years from 2007 to 2020, and now there are over 71,000 active eagle nests in the lower 48. But when I was growing up, yeah, thank you. It was me, I did it. When I was growing up, you didn't see bald eagles. You didn't see bald eagles in Missouri. You, didn't, you couldn't go down to the Missouri River 
in just in Columbia and see a bald eagle. You certainly couldn't drive down Highway 63 and see three of them in between Columbia and Jeff City, right? They they weren't here, you know. And I'm sure that you know somebody in this room is, has a story about seeing an eagle in the 80s or 90s. But what I could tell you is, is I was born and raised in Jefferson City, but I don't have a story about seeing an eagle in the 80s or 90s. I just don't. And when I first started wildlife photography, every time I would see a bald eagle, I'd be super excited because of that fact, slam on the brakes and take a terrible photo of a bald eagle. Yeah. Yeah. So much so to the point that I actually got bored with taking pictures of eagles. There was a movie that came out in 2010 with Steve Martin in it about birding. And about halfway through that movie, they see a bald eagle. And in that movie, they go, Right? <laughs> because that's how common they are now. And I think that's that, that bothers me a little bit. So what I decided is I stopped being bored with bald eagles. And instead of thinking, hey, there's so many of them, now what I think about is the journey that they had from nothing to almost being back to scratch. Right. And the reason that I left it on this screen is because this particular eagle right here is kind of famous in mid-Missouri. Um, his name's Bane. It's a terrible name. <laughs> he had a band on his leg, and somebody got really creative and decided to name him Bane. <laughs> and in uh, 2019, a uh, photographer, not me, got a photo of that band that was good enough that they could finally see all six digits of the number on the band, and they sent off the information. And what they learned is, is that he was 29 years old. Oh. And bald eagles only have a life expectancy of 30 in a zoo, right? So if you wonder how good are they doing at Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area, I guess they're doing pretty good, right? Um, 29 years old. He didn't disappear until he was 30. He disappeared the next year, unfortunately. We learned that, the next year he disappeared. Well, that makes sense, right? I mean, there's not a lot of 101-year-olds in this room either, right? <laughs> So, you know, he disappeared, but eagles start breeding at five years, probably six, right? Because nobody meets the woman of their dreams the first year that they go through puberty. So he would have hit puberty at five, and then at six, he probably met his dream woman. And uh, they started, you know, building nests and, and having clutches. Uh, bald eagles have an average mortality rate of 70% through the that, that course, right? From, from hatching to sexual maturity is 70% mortality rate. And... Uh, the average clutch for bald eagles two. So I tried doing the math, and uh, I I couldn't do the math, but uh, I was able to kind of estimate it, right? I started so drew it out. You know, I'm doing like that new age math that the kids are doing in school now. You know, I made a lot of dots on a piece of paper. And what I what I figured out is at that seventy percent mortality rate, he's responsible for at least forty to fifty eagles at the time of his death. All right. And here's another interesting fact about bald eagles, and this is all going to tie in in a minute. But bald eagles, they fly back to within 75 to 100 miles where they were born every year, on average, right? So that means because he was born in 1991, right, which is in between that time of 417 and 10,000 active nests, that means he was pretty important to that equation because he was alive and breeding before the explosion, right? Before those numbers got exponential. And he successfully bred for 24 years, right? In at least three different nests. So there's a really good chance that the eagles that I'm watching, which is also in that same area, or at least I like to pretend there's a really good chance that these are the great, I gotta think about it, great, great, great <laughs> grandchildren, right? Of band. I did the math on that. I figured it out, right? If his first kids were born when he was six, then how many generations could they have? I think it's four grades, all right? And to put that in perspective, that would be like Wyatt Earp sitting here listening to me right now. <laughs> that's, that's how old he was. So there's a really good chance that this is a genetic line. And I went back the next year, right, after that nest had failed, and I witnessed that sorrow. And... Uh, I went back and there was no baby eagle in. I went much earlier in March. I think this was March 6th, okay, 2023. Uh, Mom hittered, she made her noise, and then she left the nest. And right there was her first ever born eaglet, which I thought was pretty neat, you know, because I did all that 
fake math and, <laughs> and made those assumptions that this is the great, 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 great grandchild of the aptly named Bandy. See it? Oh, yeah. yeah. They start off pretty small and they get they get a lot uglier than that. That's about the cutest. <laughs> that's about the cutest they get. It was day one. And that's day one. I know it's day one because I was there on March 5th. No baby eagle. Right. So that's half shit. Uh, this is March 8th, 9th. I show up and now there's two. Right. So first year, nothing. Sorrow. Second year. Two so far. Oh. And uh, the photos get a little worse as you crop in, right? You can't, I can't be any closer to the eagle's nest than this, even legally, right? Uh, but also geographically, I would fall to my death if I tried to get closer. So <laughs> I have to crop in. Uh, this is baby eagle at one, just popping up in between her talents. This is one of my favorite photographs. Uh, as time progresses, a third eaglet showed up. I can tell you all three of them made it. All right. I don't, you know, I don't know um, how long they made it, but they made it to fledge. All three of them grew up and left the nest. Excuse me. Uh, the nest gets a lot of weird photograph as time progresses. It starts filling up with uh, fish carcasses and ducks. And... Yeah, it's it pretty awful in there. <laughs> Uh, I think I think he did something bad. <laughs> Pretty sure he's being pulled off. Uh, and then this was the moment. This was the moment that I captured. Um, I'll show you right here. So this is mom. First nest failed. She flew back repeatedly for days. Uncovered those eggs. Look at them. And uh, you know my heart would break a little bit. I'm kind of softy. But then the next year, this is her looking at her first ever born. There were three chicks. This was the largest one. He popped out of her chest feather. I couldn't, you know, he, he, it just was her. And then he kind of emerged from her chest feathers like the Terminator going through those bars in the neck. Yeah. And uh, some of them still on its head as a cap. I brought the print that you guys can see a lot better quality uh, than the screen. So when you're leaving, feel free to take a look at that print. Uh, there they are, kind of posing. Uh, I I don't know why this photo reminded me of like a rock band photo. It's like, it's like an LP cover, right? I, I call them the Eagles, but I think that name's Um uh, I got them to photograph a baby eagle calling. I even got an audio recording of it. I couldn't bring that because I didn't know what kind of setup they have. I don't know how many people have audio recordings of a two-week-old baby eagle. I have that. It was still quiet enough. Uh, I can't really talk about where this is because it is kind of accessible and I take pretty extreme precautions. Um, I'm going before the sun rises. I'm leaving after the sun sets. So that's, you know, 12 hours of not drinking, not eating, not going to the bathroom and laying as still as possible. And I don't think most people are going to do that. Um, all I can tell you is, is that it's close enough to Eagle Bluff Conservation Area for me to wonder if this is the genetic you know, offspring of, of those 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 family groups. Wow. Another one of my favorite photos right here. Uh, again, I stay until sunset. This is sunset, right? I don't leave until they have no clue that I'm there. Uh, I brought this print also. I brought it four feet by six feet. You can get as close to that photo as you want. And it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good photo. Uh, I keep that in my house, and uh, I think that's pretty much it for the for the talk. So I've got uh, maybe another forty five photos loaded on here that I can cycle through slowly. And if anybody's got any kind of questions for me, all I can tell you is is that most of those photos look a little bit better when they're not projected onto a you know. But uh, anybody. Yes, sir. On the eagles, how many years will they use the nest before they build the nest? They'll pretty much use it until it destroys itself. You know, all the eagles add to their nests every year. Uh, there's one outside of St. Louis that's like 12 feet deep now, you know, and eventually what will happen is, is that nest will get too heavy for that tree or that tree will come down 
but they'll keep using it um, as, as long as they possibly can. In fact, uh, at Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area, there are six nest sites total. Uh, only three or four of them are active. There's two that are not. But one of them, the, the two that everybody loved the most, the two that were closest to the road, they're both inactive. One of them was mowing bandies, and, and it's just an abandoned nest because he died of old age. The other one, the tree came down in a really bad storm. But yeah, they'll, they'll just keep adding to those nests until the tree falls over, basically. Yes. Uh, if you want some more pictures of tree swallows, I suggest you go to Prairie Port Conservation Area because there's a lot of bird boxes, uh, many of which my husband made, and uh, they're either going to be occupied by uh, bluebirds or tree swallows. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, so right here, since you mentioned it, is my favorite tree swallow photo. You can actually see the bug coming to get. It kind of looks like an X-wing, you know, from Star Wars there. Yeah. <laughs> So I love photographing them. Uh, there's a you know otter with the fish slowly disappearing down its gullet. Yes. So the earlier photo of the swallow, the first thought that crossed my mind was, how many pictures did you have to take to get that one? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, in the case of tree swallows. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos. So you, you take about six or seven hundred photos and then you go home and you look for the one that came out just right. Most of the time that's not the case, right? Um, I I know a lot of people, they take all of their photos that way. They'll take a thousand photos and hope that one of them is good. Uh, I'm kind of addicted to waiting for that moment now. But with tree swallows, you don't get that opportunity. Uh, they just fly by really fast. And that camera takes, gosh, I don't know like 30 frames a second, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so what, I have two questions. First is, what's the F number in focal length of the super lens? That is a 600 millimeter F4. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question is, do the eagles hang around all year and guard the nest just so they can use it again? That's another really good question. Uh, no, they don't. So almost all old eagles migrate to somewhere. They don't all go to the same place. But they almost all follow a, a pretty specific pattern. There are eagles that hang out here all year round, but it's it's probably not the ones that that nest here, right? So it's kind of like a shift, you know. The, these eagles go north, and then some other eagles might come in and take advantage of that area. But it's yeah, odds are in the winter months you're not looking at the nesting ones. Like leaving through stuff calls. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Who does your live work? I do. Yeah, yeah, I do it all. I use uh, Adobe software at home on a computer that has to be replaced. <laughs> I believe the eagle nests are known for one sibling kicking the other one out of the nest in order to promote his survival. Did you see any of this kind of behavior? I've never seen that. Um, I know that it's true, and uh, I was really worried about it. Um, so I do have some uh, mini YouTube uh, documentaries, and you can see a lot more video uh, of those eaglets fighting. And I was really worried that they were going to kick the the smallest one out. Yeah, but you have three of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't happen. In fact, uh, Bandy's last year, um, his his last nest had three eaglets that all made it to pledge. Also. Eagle Bluffs is a very well managed conservation area, and uh, they just, you know, the food is abundant. So they, they've been doing really well there. Um, on one of those uh, the photos, you had uh, two eagles, and you had them, uh, the, that are. The lighting behind them was pop, pop. The yeah. heads out. How did you? Was that? Uh, uh, were you very, very fortunate in that? Or I was. So I, I don't use any sky replacing. I don't Photoshop anything in. Everything in the photo is as it was, and that was just a beautiful sunset at Eagle Bluffs that day. So uh, it happens. Uh, and then when you process the photo, you can just 
you know, bring that out a little bit. Yeah. What's that picture on the lower right? Yeah. This one? Uh, that, that is a screech owl. That's just a red one. So they come in two colors. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Would you suggest um, going out to people who bluffs in the morning or at sunset just for people that are kind of looking to view? Yeah, uh, uh, I prefer the morning. So uh, one, there's a lot less people there. However, um, well, I like to get there just like almost before it's legal, right? So <laughs> I like to get there before the sun is up and be there when the sun rises. But if you get there at sunrise, that's the best time to go. That's the best time to go to any, any wildlife park. Uh, the fact is that whether we call an animal nocturnal or not, the truth is that they're all they're all nocturnal, and even white-tailed deer, basically. I mean, every animal is basically nocturnal. You know, they're they're not out during the day, so at, at noon, eagle bluffs can be a little boring. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, go in the go in the morning. It's better. Pick the afternoons. I like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. The sunset is very pretty. Uh, yeah, I, those weren't in the presentation because uh, I was in Tennessee for the bear photos. Uh, I did include them here at the end just because there are black bear in Missouri that pop up a lot more often. Yes. Have you ever gotten a bear photo in Missouri yet? No, I have not gotten a bear photo in Missouri yet. Um, the thing about that is, I'll use last year as an example. So a bear showed up outside of Columbia, and then a bear showed up outside of Ashland, and everybody was like, two bears. And I went, no, no, same, same bear. So bears have a range of 50 miles that they patrol. That's the same bear. So to find that bear would be virtually impossible. I cheated. I went to Tennessee, where there's a bear around every corner. <laughs> Yes. On the butterfly photo, on the butterfly photo with the, um, there was a butterfly with blue coming kind of like a swallow tail. What kind of butterfly was it? There was a uh, one series of photos that had four butterflies on the page. There was the gray swallowtail. That's the one with the yellow X's on the wings. And then there was a uh, eastern tiger swallowtail on that. And then the one that you're talking about is called the spice bush swallowtail. Yeah. On the underside, there's some orange spots. Yes, ma'am. The nest with the three babies. Yes. Did you get to see them in flesh? Did you I did. watch all the way through? I did watch all the way through. I got to see them fledge. I only made videos when they were cute. Uh, the black <laughs> ball eagles are not attractive. <laughs> Have you ever seen the dark crystal? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of people understand that comment. So fledging bald eagles are very unattractive. Uh, but I did make sure that they all three fledged. I uh, there were a couple conservation agents that wanted to know, so I would go back and check. What was the name of the hawk that was black? That's the question. Red. Uh, what was the name of the hawk that was black? Um, oh, so on the page with the red-tailed hawks, that's just a dark morph red-tailed hawk. That's also just a red-tailed hawk. It just... Because I think that's what we saw on the screens. We can't hear it. What do you do for photos? What do you mean? Do you sell them? Oh, I do have prints that are uh, available in a couple of places, um, but I haven't uh, haven't fully launched like that process yet. But uh, the maybe I have like my ten most popular ones available on, online. Yeah. And where is that? Uh, Fineart.com and uh, Captured Encounters is the name of the LLC that sells them, and that's. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube under Captured Encounters. Um, it seems like we got, I think that's it, all the questions. So that was absolutely wonderful, Gary. Thank you so much.
And you know, I, I asked Garrett if he had done a presentation like this before, um, and he had not. He, had, he did one uh, presentation for um, kind of a small group of folks at Eagle Bluffs Conservation Area, but most of what we saw today is what he put together for this presentation. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, it was really great. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. So I do want to give a few shout outs. First of all, David Owens um, for doing our sound today in so many ways. Thank you, David. Um, Drew Lemberger, our board president, who has his own bar, but he comes up here to attend bar for the speaker series. Um, in many evenings, you can find Drew uh, down near the Katy Trail in Rochefort. He has a place called called Mount Nebo Inn. Uh, it's also known as Bridgeport Winery. Um, and it, it's sort of the only bar in Bridgeport. It's kind of great. It's super great. Um, so definitely check that out um, if you're around and you haven't done that yet. Monday nights, by the way, are pasta night. Um, also, just in general, the Lady Bourgeois Bistro has been just such a wonderful home for the speaker series for so many years. Um, I know we're, we are sad to be moving to a new location. We're also super stoked and excited for this new chapter for the speaker series. So we hope you guys will be able to join us in Columbia at Reichman Indoor Pavilion at Stevens Lake Park um, starting next month on the second Tuesday. Um, also, thank you to Elisa for bringing some of our stuff today and running a microphone. Thank you to Joe Anglin for running a microphone this evening, um, and Tabby for coming early to help us set up. Um, thanks to all you guys for showing up. Most of all, thank you, Garrett, for putting this awesome presentation together.